Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. You see, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and a minister of a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe you will roll them up, like a garment they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will have no end. To which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Because of that, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by the angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness by signs and by wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, he distributed according to his will. And now, he has put everything in subjection to him. He has left nothing outside of his control. Bible Thoughts, thanks so much for joining us over on our podcast series where we are seeking to discover the biblical epic one book at a time. Woo! We see the Bible as this unified story, right? We see the Bible as it orbits its entire being around the person of Jesus. We see the Bible as being really old, from a completely different time period, a completely different culture, and thus we see ourselves as needing help to understand this document. And so... That's why we are here. We have been tracing one major theme, one, one theme throughout the entire Bible. And this year, it's been the theme of the Messiah. I was super interested in this theme all the way back in November of last year, wondering where people got the idea that the Messiah would be a warrior, wondering where the idea came from that the Messiah would overthrow Rome. But now that we've gone through the entire Bible, I see clearly why people would have thought that. I see clearly how the entire Bible points to the person of Jesus. 
You see, it was set up for us in Genesis 3 verse 15, when God said that from the seed of the woman would come a man to crush or to bruise the head of the evil serpent, the serpent that had found its way into the garden that was in the country of Eden. From there, from that moment, from that epoch, we begin to be on the lookout for this man who's going to come and crush the head of the snake. But for one reason or another, whether it was Cain, whether it was David, whether it was Saul, all of our main characters fail. But those failures are super important. Because through those failures, we see the kind of qualities that this snake crusher needs to possess. And it's quite the dang list. I mean, seriously, it's wild. He needs to be righteous, which right off the bat is going to be super hard. He needs to be in right relationship to God. He needs to be just, which means he needs to be in right relationship to other people. He needs to be a redeemer of the created order. He needs to be a prophet. He needs to be a priest, a king, a warrior, the Messiah, which means anointed one. He needs to be perfectly attuned to the will of God. He needs to be a tree of life, a wise poet, the defeater of death, the victor of nations, the redeemer of all that we call good and right and holy in this world. And through that, the Old Testament told us that he will bring all things together all things together in this new Eden-like state of existence through the act of crushing the snake, Eden will be ushered back into this world. Well, then we meet a man named Jesus. And the biblical authors, the ones writing the Bible, especially the ones writing to Jewish audiences, paint this man from Nazareth as fulfilling all of these roles perfectly. And then, when the church is sent out in the book of Acts, we see that they, the church, they are the ones who are supposed to be representatives of this perfect representative of God. The thematic continuity of the scriptures would lead us to believe that the church, so through the simple act of being the church, will be snake bruisers, snake crushers. And so Paul, Paul is this guy who begins writing to these churches to help them see that they have been entered into this grand cosmic narrative that's been playing out since the beginning of time. And so, that's where we find ourselves today, exploring the letter to the Hebrews. It's a mysterious letter. It's shrouded in intrigue. The letter to the Hebrews is written by an unknown author. It was received by an unknown audience. And so thus, its historical context is largely unknown. Yet it stands to this day as one of the most interpretive devices that the church and the early church had in its grasp. In fact, the book of Hebrews served as the inspiration to begin the scholarly journey that became this very podcast series. You will hear today, as we search through the book, where the author is getting this information from and, and how we saw it all play out just as described in the letter of Hebrews. That is, if you've been following along since the beginning. And if you haven't, I encourage you to go back and listen to the Old Testament recap episode and then just catch up from there. But anyway, the letter to the Hebrews is a dense, densely compact letter. It contains wisdom well beyond my capabilities to understand and well beyond the limits of time that we have for this show. So while we won't get to everything in the letter, I think that the letter to the Hebrews gives us radically important insights as to the nature of the snake crusher, all done without using a 47 episode podcast. <laughs> the letter to the Hebrews is a complete theological treatise on how, why, and what Jesus did as the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. And we can surmise that it was written in order to fight against some sort of unbelief. So whether it was the original audience that was losing their faith, or maybe they were losing their hope in Jesus, or option number two, it was that the messianic Jewish followers of Jesus needed a more robust apologetic on their evangelical journeys. We can't say which one it is for sure. 
But we do know that there was a great deal of persecution among Jewish and Christian peoples in the time of the first century, especially during the time that this letter was being composed. So for the sake of consistency, let's just take the stand right now, put our flag in the ground, that it was the original audience that was losing their faith. And it was these difficult times of trouble that came up against them through the Roman government. And they needed, the audience that was losing their faith, they needed this renewed understanding of hope in their newfound Messiah. I would think that this seems to square well with the previous episodes that we've done on the epistles, but if you'd like to go read more, I encourage you to go do so. Go pick up a commentary or a study Bible or something. The letter to the Hebrews starts off by connecting the ancient ancestry of the listeners, the Hebrews, to the messiahship that they have found in Jesus. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, the author writes, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He meaning Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his very nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power, the author says. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. That's Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, if you wanted to know. It's straight up like the epilogue to The Lord of the Rings, and it's total fire. But more to the point, it perfectly begins to surmise the thematic elements that are going to make up this book. I, I mean, the letter to the Hebrews is just pure poetry. From here, the author begins to talk about how Jesus is superior. He starts off by talking about how Jesus is superior to the angels, because Jesus is the creator God made incarnate. And then Jesus, the author argues, is the sustainer of the universe and the exact imprint of God. And thus, Jesus is greater than all of the angels because the angels are created beings. And thus, they're subservient to Jesus. The author goes on, Jesus is greater than Moses even, they argue. You see, Moses was this, this premier archetypal prophet of God, who spoke the words of God on behalf of God, and even wrote some of the most influential Jewish scriptures of all time. And you see, Moses led the Israelites into freedom, which since him, the prophets attempted to do in this kind of spiritual sense, but almost none of them were successful at it. We talked a lot about that in our Old Testament episodes. The author argues that Jesus did all of these things, but to this cosmically more significant degree than Moses ever could have. So Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than the high priest, the author argues, saying that Jesus is the true high priest who, who truly and with finality is able to lead people into the presence of God, all while being able to truly and rightfully sympathize with the patrons of this new tabernacle. And since Jesus was sinless, he didn't need to offer sacrifices for himself. The author notes instead, as the perfected sinless human being, Jesus's body is willingly offered as the final quote-unquote sacrifice. I say quote-unquote because, I mean, he rises from the dead and it's really theologically complicated, but let's keep going. And it's worth noting right here, that the author knows that, at least up until this point, many Hebrew people are going to take problem with their arguments. And it's basically for one major reason up until now. Jesus cannot be a great high priest. He can't be a great high priest. He can't be a priest at all because he's not in the order of the Levites. Jesus is from the line of Judah and everybody knew it. And so, therefore, he can't be a priest. Well, the author would argue by saying that, actually, Jesus is a priest. Because he is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. You see, there's this mysterious character found in Genesis 14. He's this priest king, and his name, Melchizedek, 
means king of righteousness. And, and he is the king of Salem, which means peace. And so we put it all together. And this guy, Melchizedek, his name literally means the righteous king of peace. And this righteous king of peace comes to bless Abraham because Abraham has this robust sense of righteousness and justice, which also suggests that Melchizedek had an even greater sense of righteousness and justice to recognize it in Abraham. You see, the author of Hebrews sees all of this, and he sees this character, Melchizedek, as a folly to the Levitical priesthood that's established by Aaron. You see, what I mean by that is where the Levitical priesthood failed from the very beginning. I mean, just go back and read the stories of of Aaron and his sons when they try to offer their sacrifices for the first couple of times. It's a total disaster. The Levitical priesthood fails from the beginning. Melchizedek then remains this, this shining example of the righteous priest king of peace throughout the Old Testament. The author of Hebrews seems to think that Jesus is more in line with this figure, the righteous king of peace, than with any other priest that's ever come from Levi. So, I mean, following that same flow of thought from the priests, you know, people who lead people into the presence of God through rituals and sacrifices, the author of Hebrews continues on their letter by talking about the sacrifices that need to be offered in order to enter into the presence of God. You see, the author claims that the earthly sanctuary, which would be probably the earthly temple in Jerusalem, this earthly sanctuary is is a reflection. It's a representation of a true heavenly sanctuary. And since Jesus is greater than Moses, and Moses, remember, built the first earthly sanctuary, the tabernacle, and Jesus is a greater high priest than any high priest that has ever lived, then we can assume that the author is claiming that Jesus is the one who is architecting this heavenly sanctuary here on earth. And so, the author goes on. They note that the sacrifices on earth, they need to be offered repeatedly. And it only allows a limited access to the presence of God. I mean, that's really logical. You just think about it. You offer your sacrifice, it atones for your sin until the next time you sin and now you're cut off from entering into the presence of God again and you have to go offer your sacrifice and then you're atoned for your sin until you sin again and and then you, you have to go offer another sacrifice. I mean, the author of Hebrews is arguing that uh, the whole system of atonement is limited. <laughs> I am not titling this episode Limited Atonement. The author claims that the old system of sacrifice is limited in its power to atone for sins. But then Jesus comes along in the heavenly temple, a perfected high priest greater than the angels, offers himself as a final sacrifice. And since it is offered in the heavenly sanctuary, not a reflection, not a representation of the heavenly sanctuary, but in the heavenly sanctuary itself, the author argues, it therefore allows full, unadulterated access to God for those who repent in the name of Jesus. Because of these reasons, the author of Hebrews makes very, very clear from here on out, about chapter 10 or 11, The Hebrews that the author is writing to, they ought to hold fast to their faith, just like these great biblical characters of old. And as the author takes the audience through this kind of virtual walking tour of all the great men and women who held fast to the faith in ages past, the letter to the Hebrews fades out. The reason why I love the book of Hebrews is because it reminds us that if we look at the scriptures as this epic that orbits around the person of Jesus, then even the most mundane passages in the Bible 
revive themselves with beauty and hope. You know, we can read these these long genealogies as these beautiful, epic poems that are reminders that one day, a genealogy will come and lead straight to the Messiah. All of those passages in the Old Testament that people have tons of problems with uh, about wrath and anger and violence, we know if we look at it through the cross, that that wrath was taken upon the shoulders of Jesus at his death as he absorbed the wrath of God that was always meant for us. And the author paints this beautiful picture of Jesus as being greater than the angels, right? Greater than Moses, greater than the priesthood, greater than the tabernacle. And all of that reminds us that we, as the church, as the body of Christ, are entered into that same space of glory. I don't think we think about that often enough. And I think we begin to lose hope in our faith because of it. You see, the reason why reading through even the most mundane parts of scripture with Christ in mind would engender hope is because we see that Christ got what we deserved. And then because of that, we get what Christ deserved. Namely, eternal life in perfect relationship to the Godhead. I mean, if you look through the scriptures and you see yourself in the people presented, then you have to take a long, hard look at how you think about yourself. Because you can't fulfill the role that even they couldn't fill. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of this entire podcast, right? You're not David slaying Goliath. You're the cowering Israelites. I'm David when he encounters Bathsheba. Not when he encounters... Oh, what's another... <laughs> Wait, maybe he doesn't have any more successes. I did a whole thing on this. What's another success, David? He runs from the guy. He's a coward. When he tricks Akish? Point is, I'm David when he encounters Bathsheba. I'm Saul. We are Eve. We are Jezebel. Our life is lived in active resistance against the God of creation. And so the fact that Jesus came and looks at all of that, looks at all of that sin, and looks at all that we've done and offers us eternal life, and offers us his own inheritance, that's a scandalous, weighty grace that deserves at least an iota of thought. <laughs> and the author of Hebrews is saying that in the midst of your affliction, in the midst of your hardships, Think about how uncanny it has been for God to have moved heaven and earth, time and space, life and death, just to see you become a part of his family with all the baggage that you bring to his family. Just to see you adopted as sons, and, and yes, as sons, with the full weight of the inheritance that comes with being a firstborn son. You are brought into the family of God in spite of your sin. Your suffering, then, does not become vain. It becomes wrapped up in the human story that all leads to and points to Jesus Christ. Your suffering, then, serves to give yourself and, and others, honestly, greater clarity as to the person and the work of Jesus because it is wrapped up in this epic tale of redemption and you cannot get out from under the will of God. And the will of God is that everything will be brought into subjection under Jesus Christ, including the affliction and the injustices that have been committed against you simply one day that will all serve to show how glorious and how perfect Jesus' redemptive plan always was. You see, the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, shows us that as the people of God were chosen on Mount Sinai, so too the people of God were justified and brought near to God on Mount Zion. And Mount Zion, with all of its implications, with the blood-stained rocks underneath the cross of Jesus Christ, as he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
the people of God were justified and brought near to God on Mount Zion. For those who have ears, let them hear. Now, go. Reread the book of Hebrews today with all of this in mind and just let it wash over you. <laughs> you see, this, this epic tale of redemption, it's no small reality. It affects everything, including our sorrows. Thanks so much. This was Bible Unbound. We'll see you next time. Thank you.